Couch Chats is a series of real, open, honest and raw chats with some inspiring friends and women I have had the privilege to meet along my entrepreneurial journey. So I wanted to share these casual interview chats with you all to leave you feeling empowered and inspired. I am your host, Jess Williamson, a serial entrepreneur and business coach. And today I have a very special guest, Lisa Messenger, joining me from Sydney. I met Lisa a few years ago when she was running a full day workshop in her offices at Collective Hub and there was only about eight of us so it was an amazing day we got to spend a lot of time with Lisa and she actually taught us a lesson about how to make it easy for people to say yes and we will elaborate on that in the interview but I wanted to just give you guys a bit of background um, and a bit of context around that so Lisa just finished teaching us the lesson and I thought to myself, no one ever comes to Perth, no big headline speakers. That was the reason why I was all the way in Sydney. So I thought, let me get Lisa over to Perth. The worst that can happen is she says no, but she just taught us how to get people to say yes. So off I went and I asked her, are you going to come to Perth? How can we make this happen? And then after many months of planning, um, discussing with her team, working alongside them to make this event happen, she came to Perth and actually asked me to MC, which was a really, really crazy um, experience because I'd always been so petrified of public speaking. But before that, I was making it my effort to get out of my comfort zone, say yes, and do more speaking gigs. So the night was incredible. Um, I did MC the event, which is so crazy to me to even still say that. But we will jump into the interview and Lisa will explain a little bit more so that you guys can have some really key takeaways from that experience as well. So welcome, Lisa. I am so excited to have you joining me on the Couch Chats podcast. Ah, uh, Jess, it's so beautiful to be here with you. I have a very soft spot in my heart for you, so very beautiful uh, to be here. Thank you so much. Um, I was just explaining to everyone how we met in Sydney and you just finished explaining to us how you got Richard Branson to put your magazines in Neck Island and you said the key lesson here is to make it easy for people to say yes. And so I took that and run with it and got you to come all the way to Perth. Um, so I thought we could start there if you wanted to maybe share a little bit more about that lesson because I think it's something really valuable that a lot of people can get from that is that, you know, firstly asking and secondly, making it easy for them to say yes as well. Oh, amazing. Okay, let's do that because you're absolutely right. I think it is one of the greatest lessons in life. Um, you know, people are busy and, you know, the bigger we get, the more we're inundated with opportunities and people kind of pulling at you every single day. And so I think people genuinely want to say yes, but we need to give them a reason to do so. So maybe I'll just unpack the Richard Branson lesson first because it is a bit of fun. Yes. <laughs> And then we can kick off. Awesome. Yeah. So, um, and, and listen, everyone, to, you know, what happened here, not necessarily about Richard Branson, but how you can make it easy. So in November 2014, I was invited to go to Necker Island, Richard's um, one of his two private islands in the British Virgin Islands, which was amazing. And I had followed him for so many years. I, you know, read his books and, yeah, I was an avid fan and he has been a great inspiration of mine. And there were 28 entrepreneurs that were invited to the island and none of us had ever met him before. And it was a great privilege. And everyone got the opportunity to pitch to Rich, which was kind of a fun concept. And we had 10 minutes to pitch him anything. And I sat back and watched the majority of people ask him things that were really complex that pretty much went along the lines of, you know, this is my business and I'd love to, you know, I'd love it to become, you know, branded as one of the virgin companies and, you know, really complex things. Now, if you look into someone's history, such as Richard's, 
he actually has over 400 companies and most of them are just licensing deals and he doesn't make those decisions the majority of the time. And secondly, he's only just met us. So there's no relationship or rapport. So I watched as it was almost impossible each and every time for him to give a yes, even though you could see that he's really excited and he wanted to. And so I literally just changed my pitch in the moment and I just decided I'm going to ask him something simple. So at the time, I had my print magazine and I just said, Richard, can I send you a box of magazines to Necker Island every month? And straight away, he said an unresounding yes. And it was something so simple, but just, you know, this, the thing about that was I knew that you know, he would be either seeing the mag every month or his staff would be seeing it or people like Beyonce (laughs) who frequent NECA would be seeing it. And so it was just a really simple thing to start the relationship. And as a result, um, you know, when I left the island, I contacted his PA, Helen, and I said, you know, um, would Richard consider writing a testimonial for the front cover of my book, Life and Love, that I kind of finished whilst there? He said yes. And then the relationship built. And he then, um, they asked me if I would co-chair the Virgin Way Conference in Australia with Richard the following year. And I've since shared the stage with him in Sydney and in Brisbane. And, um, you know, he's invited me up to his um, other island in Australia on the Noosa River, Make Peace Island, several times. And so we've built a relationship. And I will just finish with this. Having owned a magazine and media for years, I know that people pitch all day, every day to me, hey, can you do this? And the majority of the time is it's all about them. It's all about what's in it for them. But if you just change that mindset and flip it to make it about what's in it for the person or the community or the reader or whoever the audience is of the person that you're actually contacting and you make it really simple for them and you're evaluating to their life and the life of their community, then pretty much each and every time someone will say yes. And just to your um you know, kudos to you when you asked me to come to Perth. It was an absolute no brainer and I loved it. And yeah, and, and here we are now on your podcast. So well yes. done to you. <laughs> no, thank you again. And I mean, just on that, obviously coming to Perth, it's not just around the corner from Sydney. So it wasn't as simple as probably sending a box of magazines. But the lesson that I took away from that was make it easy for you. So I said, hey, I'll find you a venue. I'll, you know, put in some work and see what we can do. So I think there's so much that people can gain from that and already out of the bat two minutes in and there's so much value that people can hopefully take away from that. So um, that's just definitely one story that's always stuck with me and it's been such a valuable lesson. Thank you. And actually, can I just unpack that one step more because in your instance because so many people and everyone listening to this will relate I mean everyone has something of value and everyone at some point will say to you hey can I pick your brains over a coffee or or hey I'd love to collaborate like that in and of itself is not useful to anyone but in Jess's case you were like you know can we do an event in Perth but then you went If you had have left it there, I probably would have been like, oh, too hard, you know, like, but you went, as you just said, so much further and you're like, I will find the venue. I will get the bums on seats. I will make this happen. And I was like, absolutely, let's do this, Perth. So make it easy for people. Yes, amazing. Well, thank you so much uh, for sharing that story. What I would love to jump into now is a bit of a change um, from what we were just chatting about, but I wanted to chat about why having a niche and a core purpose is so much more important than the deliverable because I've seen so many people get stuck on, you know, I'm a swimwear business or I'm a book company and they get so caught up on just creating books or just creating swimwear in my case um, and not thinking about what does my audience actually need because the world is changing so fast, the internet changes so fast, formats, needs, wants, everything changes so fast these days. It's not like 20 years ago where you could write a business plan and it's stuck for the next 20 years. Um, Mm -hmm. But you've done such an amazing job in that, in not only your businesses before Collective Hub, but throughout that and how you've sort of broken that down and pivoted into so many different areas. I think it's a really (laughs) important lesson because I've seen so many people get so caught up on, this is what I do. I make skincare and I've got to just stick to skincare. So I would love you to explain a little bit more about 
how you found that core audience and core um, purpose and how you decided to pivot at each stage. How did you know now was the time? How did you know it was, you know, maybe not working or there's a better format out there to deliver that message? Yeah, thank you. Great question. And there is a lot in that. So here we go. (laughs) So I really just, you've just summarized it so well. I mean, that encapsulates my thinking. So I really truly believe start with your purpose. Don't start with the product. So for me, it's all about igniting human potential. So three words. Um, that is my kind of business mandate, ethos, vision, mission. And then for me personally, it's about being an entrepreneur for entrepreneurs, living my life out loud, showing that anything's possible. So that is like where it all starts, right? So what happens then underneath all of that, so that gives me like precision focus, really it's kind of in three buckets. So one is print, one is digital, and one is events. And what happens is, and Jess, you talked about, you know, your label swimwear or you talked about a makeup brand. So many people get um, caught up in, I'm going to make this product and it's only about that. But if you step back and go, what's the feeling I want my audience to have? Um, you know, what do I want to be remembered for? What's my why? What's my purpose? Then actually it enables you to morph, iterate, pivot, change, as I talk about a lot with the external factors that are beyond our control. So, um, Jess, what's yours? Have you got one for your, I'll use yours as, as an example. What's your actual, what's your, yeah, what's your for my swim For yeah. my swimwear, do you mean? Yeah. Yes. Um, so for my swimwear, it was always made for the feminine adventurers because I love adventures, um, mm. you know, seeking new opportunities and, but still, you know, our designs are quite feminine. So that was where that came from. Um, Amazing. And yeah. Amazing. So I'm just going to unpack that. So if everyone listening, it, that then becomes not just about swimwear. So, and as Jess has done so well, you're then able to, like if something changes and suddenly, you know, the season's changed or no one's into swimming because it's not the cool thing anymore, <laughs> whatever it is, with Jess's overarching purpose, you're then actually able to deliver different products or different things across different mechanisms and by that I mean and you've done so much of this you know create a podcast that's in line with it or you know um all sorts of other digital strategies masterclasses events any one of us can create other products you know stemming from our purpose and this is I talk a lot to corporates about this the problem with so many of them is that they focus so much on the product and a specific delivery mechanism. And then when something like COVID hits, for example, and you have a traditional bricks and mortar business, think hospitality or hairdressing or, you know, weddings or venues or a myriad of other things, the beauty industry. If you don't have something more than just thinking about this is what we do, then it's very, very difficult to, you know, translate that and future proof your business. So yeah, I always urge people think more about purpose and think less about actual product and delivery mechanism and if anyone's sort of scratching their head thinking well I don't know how to find my purpose um here's a very simple kind of way to start to work through it um I always say think about you know what juices you up what excites you what makes you want to jump out of bed in the morning and you just think ah when I'm doing this thing I just feel alive so that's kind of number one I think is a good place to start number two I listen to that kind of external validation so people might be like you know wow Jess you're really great at like creating da 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 and then you're like huh actually I kind of am and so then if that marries up with your passion and the number three is look is there some kind of commercial reality is there a market for this and if those three things marry up from a business sense, then, you know, it's probably worth having a shot. But you might get to number three, and as many be- people do, and you might go, actually, there's absolutely you no know, commercial reality for this. Mm-hmm. Like, I love it. It excites me. And people say I'm great at it. But, hey, maybe it's just a good hobby. So, yeah, just see if those three things start to gel and have a bit of a play with that. I think it's a good place to, to, to kick I off. I love that. 
It's awesome. I think for me, I struggled with that for a long time. I was like, oh, Lisa always talks about this purpose. I even <laughs> read her book about it and I'm like, still don't get it. And for me, it was actually going through like a learning experience for myself and we all had to meditate in the class and I don't actually really meditate. I know I should do it more often, but I did it this time. And normally my mind wanders and, you know, it takes practice. But mm-hmm. in that moment, something just came to me. It just popped into my head and it said, Jess, you need to share your experience with building a product-based business and being a young um, female entrepreneur. And that's something that's really stuck with me. That's where this podcast has come from um, and all of my education that I share now and my free tips and things on my Instagram. So for me, it was just, I think you've shared this as well, you know, stepping back and taking that step back from trying to overthink it. And sometimes it just comes. Yeah, and that is right. Oh, and exactly what you just said. I mean, sometimes the art of surrender and letting go of control and what we think the outcome should be and actually getting still, which is very counterintuitive to a lot of us who are, you know, <laughs> over-engineered brains and all that kind of thing, just let it come. And sometimes you'll be surprised. You'll be like, wow, that's amazing. That's actually, you know, it just falls in and or drops in and suddenly you feel in flow, like everything just becomes easier. And I talk a lot about, you know, the synchronicity and the serendipity and things just start to open up for you. So yeah, be unafraid to let go of the control of what you think it should be and just surrender a little bit to what is. Absolutely. And just on that topic, obviously you've written your book about, you know, how you sort of broke down a collective hub and now have rebuilt it and pivoted and all of that. But I think another thing that I've noticed a lot of people struggle with is that traditional idea of success. So having the big teams, having the shiny new office, having, you know, the planes flying all over the world or having the bricks and mortar shop when that doesn't actually deliver what your main goal is to the best of your ability. So how did you sort of firstly identify that? And then did you ever have any of those thoughts or was it just super clear because you were super on purpose and you're like, this is what I'm going to do. And I'm just going to change everything that I know. (laughs) I think you're way too kind because it was much more complex than that. Um, And yes, my book, Risk and Resilience, if anyone wants a warning of how not to run a business, (laughs) read that. But um, I think you know, so many lessons that you mentioned there. So I had had, um, I've had businesses since October 2001. So over 19 years. And for 17 years, I had a traditional bricks and mortar office and it kept getting kind of bigger and bigger until the point I had, which you've come to, um, a 600 square meter office, um, in Surrey Hills, which was like a penthouse. So it was the entire top floor of a building, floor to ceiling. Very beautiful. (laughs) Very beautiful, right? But there's a bit of ego in that. Mm. I watched um, the intern with Anne Hathaway several years ago and I was like, I want that office, right? And so, you know, I mean, it was amazing and we had a lot of events there and people would walk in and their jaws would drop and they'd be like, this is amazing. And we had um, two rabbits that used to, I don't know if they were there when you were there, but used to like run around the office, roam free and we'd bring our dogs to work. (laughs) And like, it was just a great environment, but it was um very expensive. I mean, it was over 350 grand a year in rent. Um, and then we had, you know, all the infrastructure and the, the fit out and the build. And, you know, it was very, it was very costly exercise. And, um, and then I was paying a lot of full time staff. I had over, um, three and a half million dollars. Everything was in like big, lots of hundreds of thousands or millions. Yeah, that's cute. Um, <laughs> I'm shaking with those mentions. <laughs> <laughs> well, we can go back to basics, but um, a fixed staff costs. And I realized that this is actually a crazy way to run a business because so much of what we were doing was um, writing articles about, you know, um, digital nomads or having freedom and flexibility, working from wherever, um, location freedom, you know, all that kind of stuff. And I just was like, this is nuts. Like, why am I um, thinking that productivity only occurs when I can see someone 
in my office. And also, um, I had 34 full time staff, but the majority of my team were actually already freelance. So we had writers all over the world. And um, some of my key team have been with me all of them over 12 years now, none of them have ever been full-time. So Kevin, my IT guy, I think has been with me 13 or 14 years. Kate, my bookkeeper, um, I think 14 years. Jody, um, who looks after all my logistics and distribution, like similar time frame. So all these people have never been full-time staff members. And so I started thinking about, well, why don't I use specialists, not generalists? And this is a much more clever sustainable way to run a business like bring people in as and when you need them so all of my staff now bar one is our freelance so I um, kept the majority of my staff but I said to them you know work from home work when you want how you want if you want to go to the beach during the day or pick up your kids from school you know and that was a very foreign concept to me before it, I was sort of full of ego in terms of I need the big mm-hmm. office and the bright shiny lights and I need to ha- be able to say to people I've got this many staff and actually it, it was very it had a hef- heavy cost base and um, it, it became all about organizational structure and systems and processes and HR and IT and legal and like it was a big business. The irony now is that I don't have an office. I'm sitting in my third bedroom in Bondi at the moment <laughs> and um, and we're all much happier, much more efficient. We work, you know, when suits us. Some people, my partner gets up at 3.59 a.m. every morning and he loves to work for four hours before his team start. Like that works for him. That would never work for me. <laughs> I love my sleep too much. But I realized that everyone has different priorities and if we can trust Definitely. them, and make it more data-driven, so set specific deliverables and outcomes and KPIs, key performance indicators, then actually it makes for a much more efficient, productive, you know, sustainable workforce. So our revenue, ironically, almost this year will exceed what it was when I had the full-time team and big office and our profit. Our profitability will certainly, <laughs> well, pretty much we weren't making a profit. We were losing money hand over fist. And now we're actually going to make, you know, pretty sizable profit. So it Amazing. is interesting. Congratulations, by the way, on that. Thank you. But, you know, that Huge. just that took a lot of ego and a lot of breaking it down and going back to basics and going, what am I here to do? What's mm. my purpose? How do I best serve? And I can't serve if I'm lying on my bathroom floor every night crying because oh. I can't make ends meet because I have to keep trying to keep this entire thing afloat. It was just so expensive. Yeah. It was too expensive for the revenue we were bringing in at the time. Definitely. And just on that, I mean, even that's some amazing, amazing tips from a business point of view, but even as an employee, I think the number one reason I quit my full-time job was so I could go to the beach when I want to, (laughs) in all honesty, and that just took the form of creating a business. But I think even before COVID, I was thinking this is the way of the future. People can work at home, they can work, and you can hire the best experts from all over the world. You're not restricted by just your 20 kilometer radius. And so exactly. even from an employee point of view, I think it's an awesome opportunity to be a freelancer, work whatever job you want, have the flexibility of running your own business, but also working for someone else. That's it. I mean, I've got people now like literally working all over the world. I mean, we did before in a freelance capacity, but, you know, actual, but a lot of that was our writers. But now like, you know, really senior management people I have working, you know, in Texas and Tokyo and I've got like people lit literally everywhere. And so we're working across, you know, several time zones and our productivity and the efficiencies are, you know, quadrupled. So uh, that was me having to change, you know. Mm, yeah. And like you mentioned, there was a lot of mindset shifts, obviously with ego. What was one of your biggest lessons um, personally through that period? Oh, bigger isn't better. You know, for so many years, also, and you know this well, Jess, but for the first 11 years of my businesses, so really until I launched Collective Hub, my print mag in 2013, um, so sort of 2001 till 2012, I only ever had three staff, like full-time staff. And I always used to be embarrassed because it was almost like a success metrics was, you know, people say, oh, how many staff do you have? And I was like always embarrassed going, oh, three. And now I realize that 
actually, I'd be super proud to say that because it's, it is a much more efficient way to run a business. So I would say to people like, work out what success means for you. For me, it is freedom and choice, freedom to do what I want, when I want, with whom I want, and choice, you know, that I don't have to um, just be dialing for dollars every day and can always stressed about, God, I need to make more money just to survive, and actually focusing on what I'm giving back and what I'm able to create for my community, and I'm just so much more happy. And and the irony, as you said before, often we start a business thinking, I want to start a business so I can go to the beach. Like the 17 years, I don't reckon there's a day that I went to the beach because I always felt like I should be in the office before my team get there. I should be the last person in the office. So actually I became largely a slave to the business, you know, and now I'm like, no, I, I'm doing personal training four times a week. I'm soft stand running tomorrow morning. Like I'm I'm really being a lot more flexible with myself and that doesn't come naturally. I still feel guilty if I go out in the middle of the day for a swim or something like I still do. So I'm a work in progress around that. You know, I'm an overachiever. I think <laughs> so, we're all a work in progress. I don't think we ever <laughs> stop progressing, right? So I hope um, not. No, I think that's super valuable. I mean, you've just touched on a couple of times there that you've been in business for almost 20 years and mm. something that I see very often is that feeling of comparison or, you know, that people think that people have had overnight success or why are they here and I'm hustling over here and not seeing those results. I mean, social media and the online world show the highlights um, and you've been so amazing and open and honest in your books and just any of your speaking and wherever else you deliver your messages, which is pretty much everywhere. Um, <laughs> not everyone does. And I know that a lot of my clients really struggle with the fact of comparison and wanting immediate results and they'll try something for a week and and not see any results and then they want to chop and change and try something else. But really it does take a lot of perseverance and it doesn't always take 20 years. Obviously that's your story, but um, mm. what advice would you have for people around that in terms of comparison and looking for those immediate results? I think – you know, unfortunately, the reality is that things very rarely just happen overnight. And you're right, Jess. I mean, social media, we see so many things where people just show the highlights real or, you know, the end result, but you don't see all the hustle and hard work and tears and sweat and everything else that goes on behind the scenes. And even now, I mean, I've had, you know, as you said, I'm constantly pivoting and evolving and doing different things. But because I'm trying different things all the time. You know, some things just don't work. But the thing is, I'm, I've learned when to stop and fail fast. And I've learned when something's worth, you know, continuing on. And it's only through learning, testing, iterating, making little changes and sticking with something that you then go, oh, that's how it works. I mean, there's so many things that we're doing continuously that we don't necessarily get right at the start. Like after all these years in business, we've never had a, um, like, for example, a personalized affiliate program. So we've just literally set something up last week. But I'm testing that with one influencer to iron out the kinks, you know. So it's taken 10 days or something and we've kind of been like, oh, that was that didn't quite work or that whatever. So you tweak it on a micro level and then once the kinks are out, ironed out, then you can start to scale it. And I think that's really important because nothing in my experience is right the first time so better you know done is better than perfect I think is the old adage but um yeah all the time I mean same with me Jess you would have found this when I launched my podcast hear me roar earlier this year I mean I didn't know what I was doing for the first little while and I had to stick with it and work out the format and work out you know how to amplify it and where to post it and all of that kind of thing I mean we're always learning and I think I would just say don't be too hard on yourself because really just starting is part of the battle. Like having the courage to just start is amazing and kudos to anyone. And then you just like, you know, trial it and learn as you go. Yes. Amazing. I agree with all of that completely. <laughs> um, what would you say are some things that you do to sort of 
celebrate your wins along the way or your journey? Is there anything um, that you have in your routine to keep that focus? Because a few things that you sort of pointed out there is, you know, kudos to you for even just starting. But a lot of people don't look at that as a celebration. They just look at that as I've started, now I've got to do this, now I've got to do that. And I'm not yet successful until I hit X amount of dollars or until I hit that big shiny office. So I'm always really passionate about making sure that people celebrate the wins along the way and to just enjoy the journey. Is there anything that you do um, in that area? Yeah, so I always try and bring it back to like real life examples. And so this morning, this is not a business one, but it's um, I was training, as I just mentioned, I've been with a personal trainer for I think about six weeks now. I was doing three times a week and I've upped it to four times a week with him, which is a nice luxury, but I've chosen to like reinvest my money into that because I want to get really strong at the moment. But this morning we were doing soft sand runs and then like ocean swimming. And, you know, I, I call it the cry vomits. It's not very attractive. I'm almost <laughs> like, oh, God, you know when you like push to your, your end limit. And this morning I really wanted to um, beat myself up and be like, God, I'm just not as fit or as strong as I thought I was. And then my trainer, Toddy, was like, oh, my gosh, like how far you've come in a really short period of time. So I think any of us can beat ourselves up and wait for the next thing. You know, I found myself in the moment being like, I should have swum further. I should have run harder. You know, we can all live in the should have and be, you know, beat ourselves up. But actually then I was like, whoa, I'm actually feeling strong. Like this is good. And and um, it's the same with business. Do not like try and, I mean, it's such a cliche, but try and enjoy the journey. Don't think about I'll do this when or I'll have success when. Like actually enjoy the learning and learn to laugh at yourself. Like I am constantly taking the piss out of myself mm-hmm. and laughing at myself about my, you know, inadequacies in the journey or my learnings or the whatever's going on, you know. And that's the fun. Like when things start to like, click in and start to work it becomes you know really cool so don't don't compare yourself and don't wait for the thing to actually celebrate like celebrate the little wins and and work out for you what that is and stop and enjoy it so for me like I love going and getting a massage you know so sometimes I'll be like just stop or you know going down for a swim not the kind of swim I did this one <laughs> like a nice jump in the ocean or you know go outside and play ball with my dog Benny for a while like just stop and go ah you did good that was good okay celebrate that you know acknowledge it yes now just on that as well Do you have a routine or boundaries in place? Because obviously working from home, everyone's experienced it recently as well. Um, You know, you're either one of two things. Like people always said to me when I quit my full-time job, won't you just sit on the couch all day and do your washing and all of the other things? like, that's not even a thought that crosses my mind. How about will I ever eat or will I ever get out of my pajamas? Because I just jumped straight on the computer. So I was always the opposite and I'm pretty sure you fall into that bucket as well. But do you put um, certain boundaries or like routine or a schedule in place to make sure that you have some sort of structure in your days? I do. And Jess, amazing what you just said. I really believe in life. You know, mindset is absolutely everything. And you just said, it's funny, isn't it? During COVID, I think there was kind of two schools of people. There were people who were like, I'm bored. I don't know what to do. I'm just going to like watch Netflix all day or whatever. And there were other people who were like, far out. I'm going to use this time to, in my case, write a billion books or (laughs) or upskill, educate myself, you know, learn something different, get into some rituals and routines, gamify the thing and work out if I can't leave my house, how am I going to exercise here? So I think a really good discipline is to train your brain into kind of almost an attitude of gratitude and gamifying things, having fun with things like challenges present themselves and kind of flipping it and going, okay, what can I do with this? And so, yes, my I'm big on rituals, routines and disciplines and my day looks a bit like this. So until 10 a.m. generally, I call it me time. So it's like proactive time. So it's the time when I'll do my 
exercise, you know, unashamedly, not feeling bad about it. So whether it's with my PT or, you know, going for a walk or doing some yoga, um, I'll do my meditation, I'll do some journaling, I'll listen to a podcast. So it's all the things that nurture me and fill me up and educate my you know, mind, body, spirit. And then from 10 a.m., it's like game on. So that's when I will be reacting. So answering emails, you know, dealing with my teams, um, doing things that are required of me externally, you know, speaking gigs or whatever the things are. And for me, that works because it means that I ground myself and set myself up for the day before the kind of busyness and the frenetic pace of this kind of chaotic external world starts hitting me. And I feel like by then I'm kind of ready for it, you know. I'm like, okay, I've done the thing. I'm ready to take on whatever comes at me. So that's kind of what works for me. That's quite literally the sense of filling your cup up first, isn't it? Like yeah, <laughs> literally, very, you know, filling very your cup literally. up first and then you're able to help everyone else out and, and show up in your businesses. Um, and do you normally have an end time for your work day? Ah, well, this is where it gets a little sloppy. <laughs> <laughs> so, see, this is bad, right? Because I know Stephen, my fiancé, is going out to dinner tonight. So my brain, and Jess, you might be the same, I'm so naughty. Automatically I'm like, <laughs> woo extra time to work and not get in trouble because <laughs> Because I love, love, love what I do. But, you know, I, so I do have to, you know, um, almost counterintuitively or, you know, contrary to what some people do, I have to force myself into having downtime. Mm. And so maybe when he goes out, I'll actually Netflix and chill and order some pizza or go wild. <laughs> <laughs> have a party while he's out. <laughs> yeah, but I yeah. mean... It's, it's, the thing is, I just love work and mm-hmm. I love what I do. So, so yeah, I have to be more conscious around boundaries. Having said that, I'm very, very, very strong on external boundaries. So around which, you know, anyone who's like, can I pick your brains over a coffee? It is an absolute unequivocal no. Mm-hmm. But if someone says again, coming back to the make it easy to say yes, I'm always like, where's the value exchange? If it's not a monetary value exchange, you know, what are you bringing to that coffee? Like, do you have a big idea? What does that look like? So if anyone approaches me and says, hey, can I pick your brains over a coffee? Or, hey, I'd love to collaborate. I always say, um, okay, pop it in an email to me about exactly, mm. exactly what you want to do. Because also I've got a big team. So more often than not, I'm actually not the right person to discuss it. Like I'll send it to one of my team. And so I would say with people, really, um, have your not negotiables and your boundaries very tightly around you because there's always going to be someone, whatever you do, who wants to pull at you, you know, and pull things from you. And so, yeah, if they put it in an email and it's like, this is what it looks like, this is how it will serve your community, this is the commercial part of it or whatever it is, then I'll be like, okay, cool, yep. But if they can't be bothered to put the work in, then it's like, nah, it's not going to happen ever. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I think there were a few things there. I firstly want to say thank you for being honest on, you know, the fact that sometimes you don't have that boundary on the work and what time you finish um, because sometimes we do feel like, you know, all we see online is like the 5 a.m. club and you've got to be up at 5 a.m. and doing this and that and then you've got to finish work at this time or you've got to, you know, have all those boundaries in place. And sometimes it's not the reality because I'm definitely with you on that one. You know, sometimes I know I should definitely be having more breaks or, you know, doing other things, but sometimes we do get immersed in our work. So I want to say just thank you for being honest, because I think it's really relatable that we can't all be perfect to all the time. You know, we're not textbooks, we're humans. Um, So that was really powerful. Thank you. And the 5 a.m. thing, I mean, here's the truth, because before I said about my 5.45, I'm going to tell you something which you may know, but um, I generally 
do not get up until 7.30 or ideally 8. Like um, I'm a big sleeper. I'm never, ever, 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 ever tired during the day. So now that I'm training on a Thursday at 5.45 a.m., it means that one day a week I actually get up at 10 past 5 and that's not natural to me. So anyone out there looking again at social media going, oh, my God, all these you know highly effective people get up at 4 or 5 every morning, no, I do not. As I said before, my partner gets up at 3.59 a.m. every morning. That's what works for him. But, you know, he goes to sleep like on the couch by 8.30 or 9 at night at the latest generally. So just work out what works for you. And for years I beat myself up going, what is wrong with me? Like why do I need to sleep so much? And I'll go through periods where I will get up at, you know, 5.59 and do a month of training <laughs> whatever. But my natural body default seems to be 7.30 or 8 and that's when I'm like, and people then say to me, I get all the time, oh, my God, you've got so much energy. I'm like, well, I don't know. I sleep a lot, so I'm never yeah. tired every day. <laughs> no, I'm literally sitting here laughing because that is me and I do feel that sometimes. I'm like, oh, my gosh, people have put up Instagram stories three hours ago and they've already gotten this much done and I'm just waking <laughs> up at like 7, 8 maybe sometimes as well and it's yeah. so true because – my partner doesn't understand why I need eight to 10 hours of sleep either, but because we're running on such high energy all day, maybe that's why we're using more energy up. But, you know, everyone's it funny. Is different. Yeah. Another thing, just do you, but it is funny, this new 5.45 a.m. thing because the last um, couple of weeks when I've been, we go for a coffee after and my automatic thing is i got to get to work, i got to get working. And then I'm like, oh, it's only like oh, quarter to seven. Oh, we can stay a bit longer. And it's like, wow, oh, this is actually it's quite cool having these extra hours in the morning. Yeah, so and I've found see. that for me it changes based on the weather and the seasons. Obviously the sun gets up different times so you want to get up I mean lately I've been waking up a lot earlier but winter it's like 8 a.m I I just can't physically do too much before 8 a.m so you know just having that flexibility is the best part 100% hundred percent. And people with kids will be listening to us going, oh, that's okay for you. <laughs> but again, I would say don't listen to Jess and I. Like work out what works for you and if, if you're struggling with it, then also look at, you know, who, who can support you. Like can your partner, whatever the thing is, whatever support mechanisms you need to actually help you be at your optimum self, I think that's what's important. Absolutely. I mean, yes, you touched on a good point there. We we both don't have kids and there's a lot of, you know, many different factors in people's lives that, you know, are different. So um, yeah. I'm going to enjoy the sleep while I can before I do have kids. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Awesome. Yeah. Well, there was seriously so many tips and value that, I mean, even people without businesses would get a lot from this. So I firstly want to say thank you for being always raw, always honest, um, and sharing all of your knowledge with all of us. Oh, my absolute pleasure, Jess. And thank you again for reaching out and um, asking me to do this. And hopefully I can get, let's do another Perth thing. I would so love to come back. I don't know when, I think we can almost travel to Perth, can we? I think, I think we've opened our open. borders already for Christmas, Ooh. but that's probably a bit too soon. But now we have this on record. Lisa will be coming back to Perth sometime in the future. So. Yeah, that would be amazing. Well, thank you, Jess. Thank you for everyone for tuning in. And I very very much look forward to doing more together and connecting again soon awesome thanks so much lisa and i will speak to you soon what a fun episode i hope you all enjoyed that as much as i did as always don't forget to subscribe and screenshot and share to your social media don't forget to tag me at jess.williamson8 and lisa at lisa messenger so that we can share the love right back i will speak to you all very soon with some exciting episodes coming up so make sure you hit that subscribe button and i'll see you next time time.